tea is a catastrophe. We all have the moral duty to cherish our health. We owe this to ourselves and our fellow citizens. We should not become a burden on society and cause unnecessary cost to healthcare. We should abandon our dangerous habits. Government, doctors, employers, all should make sure that we take good care of our health. Those who eat too much and exercise too little either do not realize they are doing so or suffer from weakness of the will. These brethren are clearly too weak to resist temptation in an era where temptation is not restricted to an island but endemic in the whole society. We need to unmask the convenient lies with which the fat delude themselves. Interference is not just acceptable, it is mandatory. Cultures that allow unhealthy lifestyles are morally deficient, and so are the people who defend them. Let us be good fathers, let us be paternalistic. Stop the justification of unhealthy lifestyles in the name of pleasure or freedom. Sloppy living and indulging, promoted in the name of freedom, bring back disguised addiction. Fast food, fat and butter, soft drinks bring false pleasure and poison those who cannot help themselves, our children and even our pets. To lead a life dedicated to discipline should be the reigning philosophy. Health is not just a gift but an accomplishment to be deserved through hard work and dedication. It is immoral to allow people to destroy their health by eating themselves to an early death. We need to tax alcohol, sugar and fat, hamburgers, chocolate, cakes, chips, raspberries, syllabic, scone, muffins, Yorkshire pudding, queen of puddings, sticky toffee pudding and knickerbock glory. <laughs> people will thus experience real pleasure and real freedom and they will no more be the slaves of their primitive impulse to stop themselves. We should not pity those whose livers have perished because of their love for good wines or whose bellies burst because of clotted cream. There is no moral right to be stupid or weak. The soft approach, the overdose of tolerance, the condoning of sheer weakness only create bigger weaknesses. Our healthcare system should be widely accessible to those who suffer from bad luck, but not to those who suffer from bad habits. Overweight and obesity are an excessive fat accumulation. A crude measure is the body mass index, a person's weight in kilograms divided by the square of his height. Having a BMI of 30 or more makes you obese. Having a BMI of 25 or more, overweight. You can try it with the calculator of your cell phone if my talk bores you. <laughs> if no one has ever referred to your BMI, it's probably okay or utterly hopeless. <laughs> overweight, often mentioned in one breath with obesity, is not nearly as harmful, but as the number of people with overweight increases, so does the number with obesity. Therefore, I will treat them together. In 2005, according to the WHO, approximately 1.6 billion adults were overweight. At least 400 million adults were obese. By 2015, approximately 2.3 billion adults will be overweight and more than 700 million obese. At least 20 million children under the age of 5 years are overweight globally in 2005. In the USA, Almost one in every third adult is obese, but overweight and obesity are also dramatically on the rise in low and middle income countries. Obesity leads to serious health consequences such as cardiovascular disease, diabetes, musculoskeletal disorders and some cancers. These facts seem undisputed, but there is a lot of scientific debate on the best strategies for prevention and treatment. Diets are only modestly effective in the long run. I guess that 97.3% of the women present in this audience know that from personal experience. Only surgery of the stomach gives a significant weight reduction for a significant period of time, and sustainable weight loss is rare. The risks associated with overweight and obesity in relation to fitness and age and the causes of overweight, and particularly the important of genetic factors, well, that is, true. is fat fate, or of social factors. One has an increased risk of becoming obese if one's friends are obese. It is socially contagious. So if you're tired of blaming your jeans, your workload, McDonald's, all the lousy diet gurus, try blaming it on your friends. <laughs> 
causal network leading to obesity is complex and spans many factors, including the family, the education system, the food industry, the media and transport. This combination of causes has led to a busy washing of hands and blaming each other. It is not my soft drinks, but your schools, your queen of body, sticky toffee pudding, knickerbocker glory. It is the merciless pace of our lifestyle, stress, modern traffic, the horn of plenty and the way we are bombarded with advertisements. It is the fault of the sloppy, spoiled individual glued to the computer and the television and the remote controlification of daily life. One of the most <coughs> successful interventions is the APOD, relying on the commitment of a whole community, from the mayor to the school teacher, everybody joins forces to enable healthy lifestyles. Children in the cities participate in gaining less weight than children in control cities. Many people want to believe in a quick fix. A Google search for slimming products results in more than half a million sites, almost all commercial. The advertisement suggests that a single product can achieve satisfying results. The merchandise varies. Hunger suppressants, fat diets, suit to sweat of pounds, diet drinks and cookies, slimming creams, wraps to reduce low <coughs> fat storage, or even, no doubt, very effective, sewing up the lips. <laughs> Maria Callas apparently used a pill containing an embryonic tapeworm. It becomes more tragic than laughable when we realize that many can, in fact, ill afford it and spend a lot of money on these so-called wonder treatments. Their despair is ruthlessly exploited. My not contested view is that the prevention of obesity should be high on the agenda. If governments or others can enable healthy lifestyles, they prima facie should. <coughs> Enabling people to exercise, to rest, to have healthy food, clean air, clean water, good preventive health care, and to strive for a society in which there is economic equality and justice are morally good causes, as also the Nuffield Council has stressed. Healthy lifestyles are important to all citizens and not just to the obese. Policies that convince, facilitate, enable, inform, empower or nudge deserve our support. Enabling is not the same as enforcing and is a different step on the very helpful intervention ladder of the Nuffield Council. Enabling means having a choice and having a choice is being taken seriously and being taken seriously contributes to human dignity. Therefore I also defend, and that is more controversial, that individual freedom, including the freedom to choose your own unhealthy lifestyle, is worthy of protection. Why defend this? I have the following reasons. First, I think some are getting somewhat carried away in their attempts to make us change our wicked ways. They have our best interests at heart, but may have a different view on what is in our best interest. Second, I think the problem of losing weight is underestimated. I have not met an obese person who has not tried to lose weight. I have met obese people whose lives are made up of trying one slimming method after the other and yo-yoing through life. 